Hey everyone, welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon and this is the Breaking Free Show. And I am so delighted to have you join us today. Each and every week, it's an honor to have you here uh, sharing these times with me, learning with me, growing with me, and connecting with me. And I want just to let you know that, you know, we do this show so that we all can grow and learn and be freer and freer and freer because of the information that we love to pass along to you. And this is your show, so feel free any point in time to call in, to chat with us, to Skype in with us. We'd love to have you. Just know that underneath the video where you're seeing me now, there is a space, and you can put your name, nickname, whatever you like, and you can join our chat. So along the way, if you have a question or you want to communicate with anybody else that's in there, you are more than welcome to. And so before we get started, because I have a very special guest, and I know I tell you that each and every week, but they are, and it is, and he is, and I'm excited. So before we get started, let me say hi to Amnon, who is our producer. Hello. Hello. How are you? And uh, I'm, I'm just fine. You're weakening good? Uh, my weekend. Uh, yeah, actually, good. yeah, it was really good, actually. Um, you, you, need, you, you forget what it looks like when you're on a computer. On a computer, oh. you don't see the chat under the video. It's to the uh. right of the video. So if you're on a computer, people, then on the right of the video, you have the chat Field. If you're on a tablet or on a phone, then it's it'll be below. A bit of just, so, just so you... Well, it's important yeah, because it's okay. we want you to, you know, have as much opportunity for this show as possible. So thank you, Omnon. What would I do without an Omnon? It's great. I mean, there's so many ways of doing podcasts and live shows today, and I am so fortunate to have Omnon here. So with that, Omnon, will you put up that first slide for me? The Breaking Free slide. Is it up? Yep, good. Okay, so let me read to you today who we have on. So, what do dragonflies have to do with problem solving? And what can they teach us? Dr. Bruce Oberhart uses dragonfly thinking to solve big problems and will tell us how we can use it today on our show. So, Dr. Bruce Oberhart is a sought-after biomedical engineer and entrepreneur known for promoting creative thinking and for successfully spearheading first-of-a-kind techno technological developments in the fields of cardiovascular disease, blood diseases, and diabetes, and helping to solve key problems in technology developments in the cancer field. He has seen much of what works and what doesn't. However, since he had not seen much written on how to develop superior problem-solving skills and specifically to bring them into the complex landscape of a business, especially if there is an entrenched culture, he decided to write about his experiences. This was a main driver for him to write Dragonfly Thinking, and I am all about creative problem solving. I think it's very, very important to everything that we do today, and I am really excited today to introduce to you Dr. Bruce Oberhart, who has been a friend of mine for many, many, many years, and it's exciting to bring him here. So let's all welcome Dr. Bruce Oberhart. Hey there. Thank you. <laughs> so did I leave anything out? I'm sure I did. I'm, delighted, I I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's really exciting to have you here because, you know, we've, we've been talking for years and years and years about things. And I'm just really excited about the work you're doing because it goes ac across so many landscapes. And there's so much that we can learn from understanding problem solving. It's not something that is outside of us, our ability. It's something that we all can learn about. And there's so many problems today. And I'm not talking about problems from a negative perspective. I'm talking about issues and, and things that we can really help fix in, in many ways. So tell us about Dragonfly thinking. Okay. Well, uh, let, me, let me just say that um, problem solving is extremely important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And I have a series of slides that I'd like to show. But uh, before I do that, let me ask, does anybody out there know who was voted at the end of the 20th century as the most important person of the 20th century? There was a, there was a uh, basically a sponsored, uh, kind of like a contest by Time Magazine using 100 international experts to pick the person of the 20th century. Do you know who it was? 
there were a lot of people on that list. Mahatma Gandhi, for example, was one of them. But do you know who eventually was awarded person of the 20th century? It's interesting. Uh, next slide. It was Albert Einstein. Uh, Albert Einstein solved problems. He was a quintessential problem solver. He forever changed the field of science. He not only changed the field of science, but he totally changed the way we view the universe. And uh, he's also one of my personal heroes. And we wouldn't have GPS systems, for example, if it weren't for Einstein. Uh, and Einstein is known for a number of quotes. Uh, one quote is, uh, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. Another one that's very famous is, anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Another, <laughs> an, an, another quote is, this is a good one, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And also, Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. So this gives you some sense. And in the next slide, I've got a few more quotes. Uh, these are interesting also. Uh, Einstein believed that it wasn't his ability to be so smart that everybody talked about that made him successful. It was his ability to solve problems. And um, I think it's important to, to basically uh, understand problems. And in, in the next slide, I'm, I'm basically putting forth uh, different problem types. And one type of problem is the kind we have every day, like where are my keys? What did I do with them? That's a problem, and you have to solve it. Uh, a more complex problem might be uh, I'm working for a company or an organization, and we have this issue. How, we have to figure out how to solve it. Uh, or even better, we, there's an issue that nobody talks about, but it's very important, and we have to figure out how to solve it. And you can apply what you're talking about to pretty much anything, right? Oh, yes. So in your, in your history, in your background, this, this was a key to where you are today. I, exactly. Yeah. Did, were you aware early on of what you were doing? No, I thought I was a biomedical engineer. I never considered myself a problem solver. Uh, and I started off really my junior year in college as a chemical engineer, and I hated chemical engineering because I felt all I was doing was learning equations and things to help a future employer make more money. It didn't really inspire me. Mm -hmm. And then one day a friend of mine told me that there's this laboratory that a, a wealthy alumnus created in the university where you can go and do your own project. So I said, great, I want to find out about it. So I went in there, and the head of the laboratory came over to me and said, look, anybody can work here as a group or by yourself in your spare time. All you need is a project. So I said, well, let me think about it. He said, you know what? He said, you have a background in chemical engineering. I've got just a project for you. And he sat me down in his office, and he said, last year I had a heart attack, and I almost died. And what almost killed me wasn't the heart attack. It was the blood thinner that they were using afterward to keep my blood from clotting. And I started bleeding out. And he said, then I went to see how they do this laboratory test that determines how much of this blood thinner you're supposed to take. And when I looked at that laboratory test, I realized it was from the dark ages. They, the way they did it was so, it was all manual, I'm using a stopwatch. He said, that's crazy. He said, we need an instrument that can automatically detect the blood clots and measure the time of the blood clot to determine the dose. He said, there's a project for you. So I, I was very excited. So the motivated. problem was? Yeah. So, had, so you isolated the problem. So I isolated the Well, I, I tried a bunch of things first that didn't work, and eventually I figured out what did work and eventually built something that uh, they sent me to an international conference to present. And ultimately, it was patented. I actually patented you know, when I was pretty much in college. And um, I um, developed something totally new. And, so if somebody doesn't tell you what a problem is, but you think you know what the problem is, how do you know it's the problem to solve and there's not a greater problem? 
Well, this is all what it's in my book on dragonfly thinking. What you have to do is to really understand a problem sufficiently to know, A, that it's important enough to work on, and B, that um, uh, you, you would be able to ultimately figure out how to solve it. And you have to find out a lot more about it okay. before you can determine that. And we're going to get into a lot of that. Yep. To what, what, what are big problems, what are small problems, and all of that. So just hold on to your seats. And, and if you have any questions along the way, because you, you should have a question. This is deep. This is deep. This is interesting. This is fascinating. Just make sure you call in 919-518-9773. Or you can um, check in with us on Computers 2K Voice. That's on, uh, on Skype. And you can ch chat with Next us on one. the chat window, would be very, which be, would be a great thing. So just hold on to your seats, because what you're learning today is so freeing, so freeing, to, and and this is available to all of us. So, all right, I, I know I took you off of where you were, but no, no problem. Yeah, but I'm uh, going to do that from time to time. Let, let me just say this: if you take a look at the Facebook website, this is Facebook. This is the website that people say who want to be. In, contractors for, for Facebook and want to be employees, that's what they read. It says, to have the biggest impact, we need to focus on solving the most important problems. It sounds simple, but most companies do this poorly and waste a lot of time. We expect everyone at Facebook to be good at finding the biggest problems to work on. Now, let me tell you, not, not only does Facebook recruit problem mm -hmm. solvers, Amazon does, Google does, uh, Microsoft does. I mean. The, this is a key issue. Microsoft used to give brain teasers to, to prospective employees to see how good they could solve problems. So I have a question. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about Facebook for a second. In creating Facebook, whatever, what was the initial problem? People not connecting? What would have been the initial problem identified I, that, that they would identify to have created Facebook? Well, I don't... I wasn't in on it, so I don't know all the details, okay. but my sense is yeah. that uh, it was more of a situation where the technology created a solution to a problem that was there for a long time. And okay. somebody saw how to use that technology uh, for the solution to a pre-existing problem of connecting more people. Okay. And I think our world is much more connected. Result yeah, I mean, I, in general, I think technology has done a great job of doing that. Yeah, and, and uh, I would say also that problem solvers uh, create value. It's one thing they get recognition, they get career advancement, they have additional opportunities. Uh, I remember the famous quote by Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine. He said, the reward for work well done is the opportunity to do more. <laughs> yes. And, and right. in fact, that's what happens. So yeah. just, before, and I, there's so much I want to, and I've heard a lot of some of, I've heard a lot of this already, but you can't hear enough of it because it's, I mean, I've learned so much already, and I keep learning every time I sit with Bruce. But I guess I want to ask you, and would you tell our audience the importance of problem solving today? Why is it so important? Um, I, I think today we have an unprecedented amount of problems. And one of the reasons we're having problems is we're coming close to the next singularity. Now, what do I mean by singularity? Well, there was a time when we went from hunters and gatherers to farmers. We became agrarian. The agricultural revolution lasted 10 to 20,000 years totally changed social structures, totally, and all major religions came up during that period. The whole relationships and families changed. Everything changed. We were much more cognizant of the moon and the sun and how it affects seasons and crops. Total change, and that was a singularity. The next singularity was the Industrial Re Revolution. When the Industrial Revolution came, suddenly we had massive methods of manufacturing things things that never existed before. We had m incredible new methods of transportation. We had new methods of communication over long distances. We also had new medicines and also some horrible weapons of war. Right. The Industrial Revolution 
continued for about 200 plus years. And now we're coming close to another singularity, the singularity of what I would call IA or AI. AI is artificial intelligence. IA is enhanced intelligence of humans. In either case, we will have either artificial intelligence that can do things better than humans, or humans who are enhanced in some way that can do better than existing humans today. And this singularity will totally transform our planet in the same way that the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution has done. But because we're working towards this singularity, artificially rudimentary artificial intelligence is eliminating jobs right and left. Not just here, but even in China. China has, for example, starting to use robots. That's eliminating uh, jobs. We're seeing more and more robotic automation. We will eventually see more and more things like, like Siri, Cortana, and so forth that talk to us, but they're not real people. And it's going to dramatically change, you know, the, for example, let's look at some jobs. Truck drivers. With autonomous vehicles, eventually, truck drivers, taxi drivers, bus drivers will disappear. Uh, those jobs won't be there. Um, take, for example, um, the, the um, just from the standpoint of, uh, you know, job capability, people who do sales. Well, with artificial intelligence, people talking on the phone, you won't know it's a real person. They'll be the most compassionate, the most knowledgeable people you've ever spoken to, better than any salesperson. And they will take away those sales jobs. There'll be whole companies with no people. So let me in interrupt for a second, because yeah. this is really interesting. So all of that, all that you're describing that, that is going to be is a, is already been thought through as a as a problem. It's already been a problem solving thing, right? Yeah. We've already that we've already identified a problem. That's why we're creating those things, right? Yes. So we have to be thinking past what we've already been creating. That's already been solving some problem because it's going to create other problems. Yes, and I think th this is very well said. I think problem solvers will always have work. Problem solvers will create will create new new things. They'll create jobs for other people. They'll create new companies. Uh, they'll solve. We have problems on this planet. Global warming is just one of them. There are many, many other problems. They need to be dealt with, and problem solvers will be able to deal with these things. We need more problem solvers, and it'll be a very, very long time before artificial intelligence can really solve problems the way humans can. Very long time. Eventually, it will happen, but I think before that, you'll have artificial intelligence being able to take away almost all jobs that don't involve problem solving. So if we don't solve some, if we don't solve these problems, what will it look like? Well, um, I would say that uh, eventually there'll be massive unemployment because even the domestic uh, uh, house worker who helps maybe even watch children could be replaced by robots. The elderly will be cared for by robotic systems that are friendly and talk to them and take care of them and all those jobs in, in nursing homes and assisted living, independent living may disappear. So this is not depressing. I mean, no. this is not, right? This yeah. is not depressing. So I want everyone to hear that. This is not depressing. This is not saying that there is no place for you or that the human race is done. Never in, a, never, in a, never in a million, right? Right. But we just need to understand, and we need to, t and this is very important, so keep this in mind, too, for all of those of you that are listening. This is for you and for me, but this is information we want to teach our children. Yes, uh, and if I can have the next slide. Uh, uh, basically, uh, now these, these basically are what I call working definitions. They're not dictionary definitions. They're working definitions. The first one is decision making. In decision making, you've got uh, you want to come to a way of doing something, and you've got options. You've got this option, that option, that option. In decision making, you try to pick the best one. That's what decision making is. 
And that's the beginning of problem solving. No, no? actually, it's it's different. Okay. It's different. Sometimes in problem solving, decision making may be one of the tools that's used okay. to find uh, the best of several solutions. But problem solving is different because in problem solving, you're at point A, you want to get to point B, and you have no idea how to get there. Okay. Si there are no options where you can pick the best one. You got nothing, and that's why it's different. Now, uh, decision making is found in nature. Honeybees make decisions. What they do is they send out scouts. When their nest gets too big, they send out scouts to find new locations for the nest. The scouts come back and they do a dance that the hive watches. And that dance will determine which is the best place to relocate the hive. Then the whole hive swarms to the new location, which unfortunately could be your roof. You never know. <laughs> and, and then... Uh, and then the, the, that's how they solve their problems. This, this occurs, but, but uh, th this is not really a problem in the sense of going from A to B. They know more or less how to make that decision is which is the best path, which is the best location for the new nest. So it's not the same as problem solving where you want to get somewhere and you have no idea how to do it. Uh, now, tr uh, troubleshooting is in between problem solving and decision making. In troubleshooting, you've got a system that's not working properly. It could be a computer program that's not working right. It could be your automobile is not functioning properly. Uh, you, 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 have, you have a manufacturing process that somehow is not producing the right product the right way. This is troubleshooting to try to figure out how to, what the problem is, what exactly went wrong, and how to fix it. And when it went wrong, usually you can tell. Um, and innovation, the last item on this list, Innovation is creating something totally new that can be actualized. It could be a new way of doing business. It could be Facebook. It could be a new product, a new pharmaceutical. It could be a new medical device. It could be a new type of transportation. But something new and in the physical world. And innovation very often, in most cases, comes from solving a problem. Sometimes it's, you know, it, it, okay. it's happenstance, but usually it comes directly from solving a problem. So if you were going to take these steps decision-making, troubleshooting, problem-solving, innovation. Which one would you, where do, is there, is there a reason to say, okay, I would start with um, troubleshooting or problem-solving that takes me into making a decision, which takes me to innovation? Well, in the case of, in the case of, um, uh, they're interrelated, but in the case of troubleshooting, you've already got something that works, but stopped working, okay. and you want to fix it. Okay, so it's not a, a, a it's not a problem that you're having to d discover it to innovate something, really, yes. right? Yeah, it's, well, you may have to be innovative to find the right solution for it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I got a manufacturing process, and all of a sudden, the objects that are manufactured are being put together backwards. Okay. Uh, well, it, you, you try to find out when it happened. It may mm -hmm. have happened at 3 p.m. on Thursday. Well, it turned out at 3 p.m. on Thursday, they put a new, new air conditioning system in. Maybe that's somehow related. So it may turn out that the air conditioning system cooled the computer and started doing bad things, you know, something like that. But you try to figure it out. That's very different than true problem solving where you want to, say, get to a manufacturing process. How do we do it? How do we manufacture in the first place? Okay. Or decision making. We've got three manufacturing processes. Which is the best one to use? Is this one, this one, or this one? Okay. That's a little different. So you've already, you've already discovered your problem. Okay. Pretty much. And you're making uh, now, some choices. And, and innovation, you're actually putting something totally new in the physical okay. world. And uh, uh, if we go to the next slide. And we have a couple of questions. Yeah. So uh, here's one. According yeah. to John Dewey, a problem okay. well put is half solved. Why is language such an important factor in problem solving? Well, okay. I, I would say that uh, really the most important thing, and this is something a lot of people don't know about Albert Einstein is that he was a good communicator, and he communicated with every scientist, every physicist, every mathematician who knew anything about the problems he was interested in. And he went out, he networked, he sought them, he developed the appropriate language to be able to, in their field, to be able to ask them the right question. And with the right question, he would get an answer, or he would, he would develop more questions, and it led him to go further. So being able to communicate effectively is very key in terms of understanding a problem. And uh, it, 
A really good problem solver isn't just good at logic. A really good problem solver is also a good communicator. You have to be effective. So it's logic. It's, it's, it's problem solving is a balance of logic, communicating, and being creative. Yes. And that's a very important combination because that covers everything that you can possibly, because communicators are not always great. I mean, logical people are not always great at communicating, right? And because and, it's, 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 it's more of the head, not of the heart. Communicating is more of the heart. And creativity is more of, every, of, of all the things that are outside of everything that, that, that is against logic. Yes, and I, <laughs> let me, let me uh, coming back to, uh, to innovation, let me say a little bit about that. I was at, uh, a panelist at a briefing at the U.S. Senate uh, in 2010, and there were two inventors on this panel and a bunch of patent attorneys. And the, the, object, the thing we were, do, dis, we were discussing was the new patent legislation uh, called America Invents, which was ultimately adopted. And during this time, when the word innovation came up, and it was said by, by I believe, one of the patent attorneys, that innovation is the biggest driver of U.S. economic growth. There was not one person in the audience who disagreed with that. Mm -hmm. The only question they came up was, how do we increase innovation? Well, nobody offered a way to do that. After thinking about it, the answer is you get more problem solvers out there. That's how you increase innovation, and that's what we need to do. Uh, so I, I just thought I would mention that, and I, I think that uh, it's very key to understand that even in companies, companies that are very successful, they have what's called norms. They have ways of doing things. This is how they developed things in the past. This is what they've always done. It's like the law of gravity. You follow our principles. But those, those principles very often become obsolete as things change. Mm -hmm. And it's important if you're working in an organization to find things that really need to be changed and to change them because that advances your organization. It will advance you also. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the next slide here. And while we're doing that, I just yeah. also want to comment about so, so Bruce is speaking about when you're in an organization and all of that stuff, absolutely. But remember something, he's also a solo entrepreneur in many, many ways. So what he has done, which is a model for what we all can do, or what many of us can do, me included, want included, is that you find people that are either interested in what you're, you're doing, that you're interested in what they're doing, that they're a piece of your puzzle, you find allies, you find mentors, you find interesting people, you find curious people, you find these people and you team up and you create a group that work together. It's really important because there's many of us out here that are on our own and the problems still exist. So we have to come together. You know, one of the things that I was fascinated by were nonprofits that would seek the same money for the same issues. And I would often say, why aren't they coming together to solve problems? Why are they all going out there with a, with a teeny piece of what they think is what they can do when they could come together with other nonprofits and, and really make a difference instead of going after the same money? It's the same kind of concept. That's a, so, that's a good isn't question. Isn't that a good question? <laughs> I've often thought about that. Why is it that nonprofits, you know, foundations, whatever they I mean, are knocking on the same door? asking for the same money for similar things when they could team up and work together. It's always bothered me. Yeah, now you do see com big companies team up and work together, mm -hmm. but nonprofits? I yeah, don't I don't know. Yeah. Ego, maybe. Yeah, so... So let's go to the next so slide. Now, the next slide, this is uh, some definitions. Some more. These are working definitions also. A BIP, like VIP, very important person, uh, a BIP is a big important problem, or a BIP. It's, you really want to find BIPs and work on them. You don't want to work on little unimportant problems. You want to work on big important problems. That's, that's the key. And it's uh, very important. Yeah. And um, now, again, we talked about innovation as the single most important factor that drives the rate of economic growth. Uh, the ability to really tackle important problems uh, really has created the greatest innovations in history. There are many, many examples of this. Uh, 
how Morse code was developed, how the steam engine was developed, on and on and on. Uh, this is this is key. It's very very important to have innovation. Well, I have a, some. I have another question. So you said the BIP versus the um, the LUP. So here I am. I'm a solo entrepreneur. I am not a scientist, but I am creative. Does it take a lot of Does it take a lot of people to solve LI, uh, LUPs to become BIPs? I mean, where do I sit? You know, where do the, some of us out here sit in this whole notion of problem solving? Well, uh, that's a good question, and I, d I don't know the answer. Oh, I love when he doesn't know. I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, but it, that's important because, you know, it's, it's, it's valuable. But go ahead. Um, I would say this. I would say if you're in a particular organization, in a particular company, in a particular country, and you know how to network, you can ask people certain questions. For example, what is our biggest problem? Like Einstein networked with everybody to find out the big problems in physics. You can, what's our biggest problem? Why do we always seem to have that problem? Mm -hmm. Why hasn't anybody eliminated that problem? Uh, eliminated this barrier to success, or whatever it is. Why hasn't this been a priority? When you begin to ask those questions, you begin to get information. And eventually, you begin to see the bigger problem and begin to understand it. And you can then determine, if you're in a company, it's, it's very useful to find somebody higher up in the company as a mentor. So when you find something really important, you can talk to them and they'll, they could be what I call an SMC, uh, a sponsor, a mentor, or a champion. A sponsor is somebody who basically wants to uh, provide resources to you. A mentor is somebody who wants to advance, help you advance your career. And a champion is somebody who wants to see it done. And you find somebody higher up in that organization, they will guide you and you can go ahead on your path to solving it. So listen, those same people are outside in the world, not necessarily within an organization. You can find a sponsor, you can find a mentor, yes, yes. and you can find a champion. Yes, it could be in government, it could be in, yeah. in some uh, societal aspect. Absolutely. It could be anywhere. Did you, before we go on, could you just show your book? Just so those of you out here, this is just, we're going to show it again, but just so you can see what it looks like, it's a real, it's a really cool book. And... We haven't really said yet what the dragonfly means, but oh, we'll talk we're about gonna that. We're going to get there, so hold on to your seats. Uh, okay. But coming back to BIPs, yes, uh, it's important that that uh, BIPs are deceptive. That is big important problems. Once you've identified one, you have a mentor who agrees you, this is really important. They're not what they seem to be. They they may be linked in subtle ways to other less identifiable issues. Um, Trying to solve a BIP is usually not possible without really understanding its, its true nature. And also, our mind deceives us. Uh, there's a thing called reticular activation. Let's say, let's say, for example, Marilyn, you just bought a Volvo. So you're driving along, and you're driving the car, and all of a sudden, you see all these Volvos on the road. You say, hey, I never knew there were Which that many Volvos. Which happens all the time, right? As yeah. soon as you start to do something, you start seeing it everywhere yeah, or hearing it everywhere. that's called reticular activation. You've activated a part of your brain. That changes your perception. You're seeing things differently. Uh, also, you may have heard something that somebody said, but it was not really said, but your mind put it in there, and you think they said X, but they may have said Y. Another example, visually, uh, just to give you one example of how our minds can deceive us, go to the next slide. Uh, this is a very strange slide. Uh, that it. Uh, is that the next one? Uh, well, um, come back. Uh, uh, after we have problems and jobs. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Okay. Hold on, we're coming. Uh, we talked about problems and jobs. That problem solvers will always have uh, work. Okay, the next one. We talked about. Uh, let's talk about general principles first. Then I'll go to the next one. So it's okay to become stuck if you're working on a problem, uh, because being stuck, you know, means it's time to. Stop working on it for a while. But your, your subconscious mind will still be working on it if you truly make that problem your own. It's also very important to ask a lot of questions, which we discuss to a lot of people, and to, and to really understand it. 
And then it's also important to ask people for their ideas and get your own ideas out there right. because ideas lead ultimately to solutions. And it's very important to recognize that problem solving is experiential, like riding a bike. You can't learn how to do it by reading it in the book. Although Dragonfly Thinking tells you about it, it also has exercises that you can follow and kind of guides you through the process. But you can't read a book and then get on a bike and ride it successfully. It's like business. You, you can't learn business from a book. You've got to go out and do it. Right, Same experience. thing with problem solving. So you're going to get stuck, in other words. Yeah, you will be it, stuck. You will be stuck. You will be stuck at, is it, a, is it worth my time? Prob is, it, is this problem worth my time? Is this big enough to invest my time? Is there an issue that, you know, you know what I mean? So you have to, you kind of, and it's great to have a circle of people that you can bounce ideas off of. But regardless, we, on, we only know what we know. So we're going to get stuck until we take ourselves or we have help taking ourselves to another level and you have those people in your life that are the sponsor, the mentor, and the champion. Remember that. You want to surround, and you want to surround yourself with people, a lot of champions, a lot of champions. They may not be the person who pay, funds your program or your problem. They just may be the encourager that says, here, go for it. I believe in it. It's great. You want to surround yourself with people like that because you're going to get stuck. Yeah, now, uh, this actually, this slide that I was talking about, we, we could take a look at now, this next slide. So you, so you yeah. talked about the react, yeah. what, you talked about the, the react. reticular activation. So this is what we're going to refer to now? No, this is okay. something, this is another way in which our minds deceive us. Now, okay. if you see the, the, the picture at the left, it shows you extending an arm with a thumb. And if you extend both arms, like this, and look away from, from the camera and just look at your thumb. If you look at both thumbs, you'll see the thumbnails very, very clearly. Now continue looking at your right thumb, but move your left thumb six inches away. And if you do that, you'll see, you can see every detail in your right thumb, but you, you can hardly see your left thumb. But when you bring them together, you can see them both extremely clearly. The reason for that is that the ability to see detail is only in a very, very small portion of the visual range. It's a place called the macula, right in the center. And once you get out of that, you don't have detail. But your mind creates the impression that everything is visually detailed. You look around the room, you don't see that you only have detail in the center. You see a whole room filled with detail. That's, again, how the mind deceives us. OK, so which means okay, in, when you're talking about problem solving, to narrow down what you're looking at? Well, what it means is the mind, although it's a tool in problem solving, also is an obstacle in solving problems. And these are just some of the ways the mind, uh, I could show many other examples. These are just some of the ways in which the mind can fool us and many other subtle ways. So to really solve a problem, you have to look at it from different perspectives, and we're going to come to that next. Um, so, okay, somebody's asking this question. <laughs> Somebody wants to know, do problem solvers like you ever sleep? How do you shut down your mind? That's a great question. Uh, I, it really is, because when you have a difficult problem very often, uh, a lot of CEOs I talk to, I, I, I say, what keeps you up at night? And they'll tell me, because it, it will keep you up. But if you focus on getting enough exercise and relaxation into your life. Because you have to do that in order to really solve the problems, right? Well, as I will say, you can be more effective in solving a problem if you don't work on it full time, but you allow time. Uh, a lot of marathon runners tell me they get their best ideas during the marathon. I have people who tell me I, I, I get my best ideas in the shower. Some people say I get my best ideas waking up from a dream, but the, the key issue is the subconscious is very key in coming up with solutions to problems. And in order to engage the subconscious effectively, one of the things you need to do is to, to develop relaxation. A very good way is to exercise. It's not only beneficial for your health, but it enables you to sleep better at night. It enables you to um, get, engage your subconscious, and ultimately a, a new idea pops into your head and you've solved the problem. And we're going to talk about this. This is all part. Now, there are lots of thinking styles that have been talked about. There's a thing called 
convergent thinking and divergent thinking, lateral thinking, uh, which was uh, written by books by Edward de Bono uh, in the 1950s and 60s and so forth. Uh, there are various strategies like the Pathfinder and helicopter strategies. Critical thinking goes way back. There are about 200 definitions of critical thinking. Uh, critical thinking is more decision making. But then there's dragonfly thinking. And it, the, why do I call it dragonfly thinking? Any, did I ever tell you that? Yeah, but I'm not going to tell everybody because I can't get So I wrote my first draft of this book. It's what all my mentors taught me in terms of how to solve problems. And I put it down on my first draft, and I said to myself, what am I going to call it? And I, and I was standing there outside with a cup of tea in my hand, and all of a sudden I see this dragonfly, like, hanging in space. Dragonflies have the ability to, to stay motionless like a helicopter for long periods of time. So the dragonfly was just hanging off in space, and then all of a sudden, zoom, the dragonfly is zoomed 30 feet away. Now, dragonflies are the fastest flying insects. They have the best vision of any insect. Uh, they have been here since before the dinosaurs. They know how to survive. And this dragonfly, I realized, was looking at the terrain from different vantage points. It kept flying to different locations, eventually flew off. And I said to myself, what this dragonfly is doing in going from vantage point to vantage point is looking at the terrain from different vantage points. And that's really one of the techniques I use in solving problems. So I must be using dragonfly thinking. That's where it came from. And uh, so looking at the terrain, the problem from different vantage points, as the dragonfly does when looking for a mate or looking for prey, uh, I might add the dragonfly is the most successful predator on the planet Earth. It has been studied by the Department of Defense for decades because they've built drones and they want to understand how an, a being with such a small brain is so successful. The dragonfly catches more than 95% of the prey it goes after. The shark, with all of its special senses in the water, only catches 50% of the prey it goes after. The lion, the king of beasts, catches about 25%. So when you look at the, the thing you just did with the thumbs, yes, how, what would a dragonfly do? Well, the dragonfly can see you even after it flies past you. So if the thumbs are together, yes. right, is the, is the dragonfly looking at the thumb together and apart and from different other perspectives and then being able to kind of put it together? Well, the, the Department of Defense and DARPA they put out a lot of grants to study dragonflies over the years, and eventually a group of scientists figured out how the dragonfly is so successful. And apparently the dragonfly does two things that make it very successful. The first thing is that the dragonfly uh, has what you call, that pri primates, humans, apes, have this ability. It's called selective attention. Like I'm talking to you, mm -hmm. and somebody comes over and taps me on the shoulder and starts a conversation, and I come back to you. Well, if you did that to a lion or a shark, they'd lose the prey. Dragonfly will always come back to the prey. No matter how many insects or, or other dragonflies it interacts with, it will still come back to the prey. The second thing it does is it's got this wide field of vision, much wider than human, almost 360 degrees, and it puts the prey at some point in that vast uh, uh, field of vision, and it keeps it at that one point and keeps heading for that point. So the problem is the prey? Well, the problem is the prey, and, and a dragonfly keeps heading for it and eventually intersects it. That's how it does it. It's the prey uh, is, in, is in trouble. <laughs> yeah, but fact, so, so yeah. Some people, some people say that hey, that's not that's not uh, that's not uh, being a predator. That's ambushing. But actually, in the insect world, ambushing, why there's no difference. <laughs> and, and I have a, something just hit me, which might not be for this conversation. Maybe we have to have this off conversation. But I was wondering what dragonfly if dragonflies have any um, biblically. biblically is there anything about dragonflies biblically? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that in Asia, which is where the largest population on Earth exists, dragonflies are held in very high esteem. They're considered good luck. They're considered as a, uh, a precursor to good things to come. And there are a lot of, you go to shops, you'll see all kinds of dragonfly knickknacks. They're very, very popular in Asia. Uh, so. So I, I would also like to say that uh, uh, it's important to, to look at a problem from different vantage points and also to engage the subconscious. 
And uh, this is a key thing in dragonfly thinking. And uh, the best way to describe this is that uh, I first had an epiphany when I listened to a talk by Dr. Oliver Sacks, who died on August 31st, unfortunately, at age 82 from terminal cancer. He was a, um, uh, a uh, psych psychiatrist who studied people with, with mental diseases and also mental abilities, and he taught a, a lot of what he learned to, to large numbers of, of the public. In fact, one of the, there was a movie based on his work called Awakenings, with uh, Robin Williams and, mm -hmm. and uh, Robert De Niro, which was a very interesting movie. But uh, he was giving a, a talk, and as he was talking, he was talking about more or less uh, different, um, uh, uh, I would call them famous epiphanies that, uh, although he didn't use that term, uh, how Hector Berlioz, the composer, uh, who lived in the, 1800, in the early 1800s, how he woke up from a dream with a new symphony and how August Kekulé, who is a chemist, in, again in the late 1800s, uh, had a dream by a fireplace and dreamed of snakes. And at that time, uh, molecules were thought to be like chains of beads, each bead being an atom, and the snakes turned around and bit their tails. And he, he suddenly awoke and he said, molecules can be rings. And he came up with the benzene ring, which started the whole field of organic chemistry. And he also mentioned Dmitry Mendeleev, who from a dream woke up and developed the periodic table of the elements, as well as some other things. So at that moment, I had an epiphany about a problem I was working with, and it came up with a solution just like, like that, and it connected to what he was saying. So uh, eventually I wrote a blog on it called the, uh, basically the Iceberg Theory of Epiphanies, and then later I called it the, the <laughs> Uh, the principle of uh, the iceberg principle of epiphanies that's in dragonfly thinking about how the subconscious gets engaged and how it works and suddenly it can just pop up. A very famous one that happened in uh, oh around 200 B 250 BC was Archimedes of Syracuse, who got into a hot tub and he felt the buoyancy. His body got lighter and suddenly came up the principle of buoyancy, just flashed into his mind and he ran out of the tub completely naked, ran through the streets with a great idea, and that forever changed the building of ships and various types of craft that were used. Uh, and as an example, uh, these, these things come when you engage the subconscious, very important. So let's uh, look at the next slide here. So, so, so let me just, yeah. um, so there's a visual component. Is there an image, there's an imagery. As you're going, uh, maybe, not with everybody, but then, obviously, you have to, like, you're tuning in and you're listening to all these connections, the subconscious, and, and then you have a vision? Well, most people are visual because the number of nerves coming from the eyes to the brain is ten times that coming, say, from the ears to the brain. But people like Berlioz, who is musical and a composer, probably what he got was music coming to his brain, not vision, not visual. But every, most people are visual. Most people are visual. Some are more auditory, some are more verbal, sequential, uh, different uh, abilities, so it, it's, it's unique. But the, the key issue is you really want to keep a problem with you. You don't have to think about it all the time, but you want to engage your subconscious. It's very, very important to have exercise and relaxation because that is very good for the subconscious, very good for you physically. So when you talk about problems, Bruce, you're not talking about just problems that have to do with medical healing or any, just all medical. Problems are, you know, I mean, are they everyday problems? Are they problems in connecting, you know? You know well, I mean? I, obviously, where are my keys is a problem that might occur to some people every day. Right. Uh, but that, that usually has an easier solution. You, you might go in your mind back to, what, you know, kind of retrace your steps. Except somebody came up with a thing that you can attach yes. to your keys that you can ding yes. a bell and you can, you'll, like your keys will ding. Yes. Hello, got it. See, eventually, they, <laughs> eventually they're coming up with more and more things so you don't have to think. And the less you think, the less your ability to really solve problems. I so you can't it. do that. Well, you can, but, uh, and for some, it increases your efficiency. But the more your efficiency increases, the less you think. Now, I'm not saying you think all the time. 
Thinking is inefficient. If I thought about everything I did when I took a shower in the morning, I'd never get to work. Then on you time. wouldn't be creative, creative problem solving. You wouldn't be balanced. I, I would be in the shower right. forever, forever right. if I thought about it. But right. but there are things you do automatically. You don't you don't think about. It. Okay. But on the other hand, uh, when it's time to really delve into a problem, you, you have to think about it. But then eventually put it aside. Let your subconscious work on it. Um, so I. I I, I think it, I've uh, really gotten him off his slides. <laughs> I have gone to the next slide. This is a very famous. This is a very famous epiphany. This is uh, uh, actually uh, an interesting one. Um, uh, this is uh, a, a gentleman who is a great, great author of science fiction, suspense, horror, um, and um, it, it's when Stephen King was writing The Stand, which many people consider his best book, he got stuck for weeks. He couldn't figure out how to end it. And he used to go on long walks, and all of a sudden he, it just came to him, an epiphany very similar to Mendeleev and Archimedes and all the others. And this is what will happen to you. When you engage your subconscious, you will end up in the same way. You will think about something uh, in your subconscious. You will not be aware of it, and suddenly, remember, Thought is not like computer programming. A lot of people think it is. It's not. It's different. Uh, your mind doesn't work like a computer. In a computer, you've got bits. you got everyone is the same. Thoughts are not. Some thoughts, they're graded. Some thoughts are graded more emotionally. Some thoughts have greater importance than others. You, computers don't have this. So you get a thought in the subconscious when you're asleep that has tremendous importance. It will rise to the subconscious. It might even wake you up, and it'll it'll come out of a dream, and that'll be the answer. So uh, engaging the subconscious is very key to solving problems. And uh, I I'd, I'd like to just say uh, is my last next to the last slide here, uh, just some additional general principles. It's very important to choose a problem wisely, and. Uh, Get some help from other people and make sure it's a good problem if you're working on one. Uh, sometimes they'll tell you, yeah, that's a good problem, but this is a better one. And they may lead you to something even better. Uh, also, it's not good to work on a problem when you're under stress. Uh, what, uh, what I do if I'm in a company and we have a very significant problem and it's got to be solved within the next month, I'll bring a team together to work on it because teams handle stress better than individuals. Because it's uh, shared. It's shared. And you're not alone. No. And you get other inputs. And it's, it's like networking, except you got them all in the same place. Uh, and then uh, it's very, very important to realize that ideas are the fuel that make the impossible possible. You've got to get ideas. Your own ideas, ideas from other people, those ideas will make a big difference. And the ideas can come from anywhere. I remember uh, one time I was uh, in a, working in a company, and I went to somebody's office, and I saw a flower pot. And the flat, as soon as I saw that flower pot, the problem I was working on jumped into my mind. And I said to myself, how is that flower pot related to my problem? And then I saw it. It actually was a solution to my problem. When you put water into a flower pot, it comes out the bottom. And the flow of water in a flower pot is much faster when you get a higher level of water, and then it slows down. And the, we were trying to build a tank that would have a an initial very high flow rate and then a slower flow rate, and that was the answer. And um, So you never yeah. know where your answers are going to be. Exactly. And, and people, just as this flower pot did not know, it was giving Bruce an answer. <laughs> you know, seriously. So people don't know that they're giving you opportunities or an answer. It's up to us to be aware, to listen, to communicate, to ask questions, to gather people, to just, you know, to look, to be aware, just to look, to be open. What? You have something uh, but to say? But you know, if Bruce was walking around like today's kids walk around, he wouldn't have seen the pie. Exactly. It would see his phone. <laughs> you would see what? His phone. <laughs> well, it's true. And it's true. Yeah, it's true. you got it's it. True. The reason why he saw it it's is true. because he was open yeah. to see what's... Yeah, but it's true. And not to say that there isn't a kid who's looking at a phone who's going to not see something in the phone or right. in a picture that's going to say, oh, I need to speak about this or I need to, this is something important, but, but we're missing, but 
all of that technology, we miss out on a lot. A lot. Yes. A lot. So did I tell you enough about dragonflies? Or? It, honestly, I've heard, Bruce and I have gotten together multiple times talking about this. And then Bruce led a round table for a the Women's Power Networking group that I'm involved with and here today. And I will tell you, now, and I read the book. On my on a cruise, and I, and I and let me tell you something. I was focused on reading that book on the cruise. Everybody else was reading, you know, fiction and all kinds. Of, I'm reading Dragonfly Popping by the pool. <laughs> but I will tell you something that I I do get it now, and it is fascinating, and it does make perfect sense. So I would highly recommend that you get the book, and that you look at what this is about, and really do your best to you know. To put yourself in it and understand it because it, it it is up to that's why we do the show because it is up to us that's what breaking free is all about it is up to us to gather the we are all dragonflies to gather the information and then to do something with it i mean we come here each and every week sharing something last week we had a great show this week a great 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 show they're all great and the reason we do this is to empower each other to go and because it's up to us. We are the teams. We are going to put the teams together. We can't wait for everybody else to do it. So, yeah, I think it was great. You want to show your book again and talk about uh, well, it? Well, let, let me just put the last slide up. Okay. Uh, just to say that w I'm involved in a number of projects right now, uh, three in the cancer field. Uh, one has to do with cancer diagnosis. One has to do with a new type of therapeutic, the world's first biologic nanoparticle that I've been involved with. And these are several companies uh, doing this. I'm also involved in the kidney disease project, but another project in my spare time that I'm working on is in my when I was a graduate student, I studied the intelligence of whales and dolphins, mm -hmm. and I'm and I have videos going back decades uh, of experiments we did with beluga whales, and I'm going to be putting them on YouTube within about a week, so that should be very interesting, and it'll relate to my website. I've got explanations about what what's what we did back then. I thought it was pretty advanced, and I, I never really pursued it, never published anything. Well, we're going to have to have you back here to talk <laughs> about, well, who talks about this stuff, really? <laughs> but we will. So um, we have, so anyway, what I want you to do, if you will, because we're, we're almost out of time, is share your book, where they find it, where they find you, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, if you go to either dragonflythinking.com or bruceoberhart.com, you will find me, my, my website, you'll find this book. If you want to read the reviews on Amazon, click on Amazon, etc. cetera. And uh, just feel free to, to, uh, to explore some of these things. And the most important thing is try to find yourself a BIP, a big important problem to work on that, that impacts you, that impacts other people, and that is something that you can, over time, find a solution to. We need more problem solving on this planet. And uh, I hope that this book will will help in that effort. Well, I, it's inspiring me to, uh, to really look deep. And even the things that I think could be big, maybe not the biggest piece of it. Maybe there's more. So I really need to look at it from different perspectives. Different it's, vantage points. Different <laughs> vantage points. And you know, I might be looking at one piece, but maybe there's another piece of the same thing that's even more important that can get done, right? Yeah. Whereas, you know, I might be looking at a particular issue from here, but if I look at it from here, it'll take in this and it'll take in more. Maybe this piece is even more important. So it's really fascinating. And I would say that if, you know, as you listen to the show, or you listen to the replay, because this is one of those shows you're going to want to go back and listen to. This is one of those shows, please feel free to share. You know, you can come back to here and... Um, you know, share it. You can go to my YouTube channel and share it. But please do share it with your friends and your children. Very important. So with that, Bruce, Thank it's you. been really good. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And everyone out there, thank you so much for enjoying this with us today. And thank you to your marvelous producer. Oh, Amnon, he's the best. I mean, I am surrounded by bestness. <laughs> bestness. That's what you have to do. Because by myself, I don't know. But together, oh, my God. <laughs> thank you all so much. And Chris is on the chat. And Suziani and all our new friends. And thank you so much for being here. We'll see you soon. Bye. You are tuned.
tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCBBI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net. <laughs>